Hi, good afternoon, everyone, and I'm really happy and delighted to be with you today. Um, before anything else, I want to congratulate the university for having selected such an outstanding, outstanding scholar and researcher to, to the highest um, recognition that the university can offer. And it is not accidental that we have quite a number of um, such outstanding faculty in the school as a Board of Trustees distinguished professors. And again, it's not probably accidental that all of them are in this department. No, so, <laughs> all but one. Or all but one. Raj. Raj is the Oh, Raj is not. Okay, but he's kind of confused or something. <laughs> <laughs> so, and and I, would have, I would have been in this department if they would have accepted them. At some point, I gave a talk on on the branch relaxation technique. 
Help me out here. Background, <laughs> right. distinction, parameters for optimization. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm a student of optimization and I follow part of uh, Peter's work. Um, but but uh, I think what is amazing about Peter is uh, they say that what one can um, donate to, to his environment more than anything else is time and dedication and passion. And you look at the 40 years that, that Peter has been with us and some of the activities that you mentioned, whether that is uh, directing BCAT or, or being part of uh, the Vinci program and supporting the high school students or a number of other activities that you have undertaken, being part of the um, Asian Student and Faculty Club and leading that, or um, when the university, when the School of Engineering needed an outstanding leader to lead and develop a, a strategic plan, Peter was there and, and he relied on his broad shoulders to do that. Um, actually, on a more personal note, when I was um, thinking of seven years ago, six years ago, whether I should run and throw my hat in the ring for, for becoming the dean, Peter was a person that I went to and sought his advice and asked him if he thought I could do this. And so, so he's been an outstanding col uh, colleague for all of us. He's been an outstanding leader. You look at his students and success of his students and where they have gone. So thank you very much, I think, that for, for training him and sending him to us. <laughs> and he has equally returned the favor yes. to the society by sending outstanding, outstanding um, graduates out. Uh, congratulations again, and it's great to have you as a colleague and a friend. Thanks. Thank you. So, um, so Peter has invited a, a few um, of his, uh, the folks that mean a lot to him uh, here, and, and there are a lot, so he couldn't obviously invite everyone. Uh, but one of the things that he, he did, and as an Asian American faculty myself, that, that he did that was important was uh, setting up the Asian American Faculty Association and then helping leading create uh, the creation of the Asian American uh, Cultural Center. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to uh, invite uh, Angela Lola to say a few words. Uh, Angela is the direct, current director, oh, founding Thank you. director of the, uh, the center. I started when I was eight. Because <laughs> <laughs> we are 26 years old on April 8th. I'm going to read here, and I apologize. I usually will stand and talk uh, verbatim, but I only have a few minutes. I can't go until 4 o'clock, Peter told me. Um, so pardon me, because I'm going to read my notes. So thank you very much for inviting me, Peter. I am totally, I was flabbergasted when I got your email, and I thought, am I going to be in front of a lot of electrical engineers? Um, and I am, obviously. So good afternoon, everyone. I am Angela Rolla. I am the founding director of the Asian American Cultural Center that has been on campus and will celebrate its 26th year on April 8th. I am excited to be with you and to honor my friend, Peter Liu. And first of all, Peter, a public congratulations to you for being awarded this high distinction. In the few minutes that I have, I'd like to share with you a bit about P who Peter is and what he has been involved with and accomplished outside the field of engineering. Peter and I met after the occurrence of a horrific racial incident involving eight of our Asian American students in December 1987. Yes, we've been colleagues and friends for all these years. Immediately after the incident occurred, Peter, along with other engineering and School of Business faculty, formed an Asian American faculty and staff association, something that had not existed on campus at the time. It was not just the urgency of creating a more formal group of faculty and staff that was its focus, but rather the realization that Asian American community issues were not of concern at UConn, that Asian American voices were not being heard, and very few Asian Americans held higher level positions on campus. Working with students, this group fought for five years for the creation of an Asian American cultural center, 
an Asian American Studies Institute, and more library resources about Asian American history, people, and culture. Throughout those five years of struggle, I witnessed and admired how people at Peter interacted and worked with all groups of people, whether it was students, faculty, staff, or administrators. He was a true social justice advocate long before the term became part of our daily vernacular and practice. He remains that way today. He is a force in a non-forceful way. He uses silence, pauses, and even a wry smile as a strategy to react to unpopular sentiment. Quite an amazing feat and very hard to replicate. His tenacity and his willingness to fight for what was right helped our community build a strong presence on campus. I, as well as the Asian American community, owes much to Peter. He continues to be a warrior for us, and I seek out his counsel during difficult times. Although I may not know or fully, honestly, fully understand his field, I know it's important, and I know what he does helps me in my daily life. I do know that here is a person that seeks to make sense of the world and find justice through many lenses. What an honor it is to have him as a colleague and a friend. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here and to share a little bit about Dr. Liu, our friend Peter, our colleague Peter, that which many of you may not have already known. Thank you very much. So, uh, uh, as I mentioned, we had, uh, as I mentioned, well, we have uh, four BOT uh, distinguished professors in, in the department, and we have two of them here, and I'd like to uh, invite uh, Yakov to say a few words, and then Krishna to say a few words afterwards. Mine is going to be oh, non Peter's. <laughs> okay. That's what he asked me to do. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, everybody, it's uh, quite a uh, show up you know so many people showed up i got to say peter that you are a very popular person and i will start with the, the quotation that uh, krishna sent it to me the other day by email saying the following yes you know you know i remember things <laughs> I, I, the good things that are worth reminding you of uh, will follow a doctor prospers prospers on the sickness of mankind a lawyer prospers on the course of mankind, but an engineer prospers on the prosperity of mankind. Now, Peter is really the embodiment of the latter. He took care of optimal electric power delivery, optimal manufacturing, optimal temperature control, all keys to our prosperity. Now, I have another version of this doctor, lawyer, engineer comparison uh, as follows. Doctors help people preserve their health to enjoy the wealth, if they have any. <laughs> Lawyers help people protect their wealth, or at least are supposed to. Uh, stockholders, and I also can add financial engineers, transfer wealth and take a good percentage out of it, assuming uh, their name is not Madoff, who made 99% of that as a commission. And, but now he cannot enjoy it anymore. Now, real engineers create wealth. And I think that really we can see uh, that we are together in this uh, School of Engineering, and all of us in one way or another, but Peter, in more ways than some of the other, that many other people contribute to it. Last but not least, I'd like to remind now Larry Hope uh, of what he said when I called him up when Peter Lou was uh, interviewing here. Why? Because uh, I knew him from the control system society meetings, and I had a colleague 
before coming here at Systems Control in Industry, who was also a Larry Ho uh, advisee. His name is Kai Ching Chu. Uh, so what I asked Larry is, how would you compare these two things? He said, I was working with Kai Ching at the time. He, we went by the name of Mike Chu for, for a while. And his answer was, these have the same natural intelligence, but Peter is an order of magnitude more hardworking. And this is an understatement, I would say, because Kai Ching Chu retired, went to IBM, took it easy, I think. After a while, he worked with me at Systems Control. Uh, after a number of years at IBM, he stopped publishing. So Peter is at the top of the profession. That is really uh, what I said, an understatement of what you said about his hard working. I even remember when he was department head, I was getting emails with a sending time 3 a.m. So I conjecture that until 2 a.m. he was working on his research. <laughs> so you can see how far he got. And uh, I just want to congratulate Peter for this honor. to be in the same company as you. Well, uh, I'm supposed to talk about our systems group in general. So, uh, systems group is very pleased that Peter Liu is inducted as the Board of Trustees Distinguished Professor. Uh, he asked me to give a quick overview of our group and also the history of our group over the years. So, uh, we are about 10 active faculty, and this is something that uh, Yakov might like. We are in a bimodal or trimodal distribution. We have got very old people and also very young people. So, and also maybe some, but somewhere, somewhat in between, maybe Peter Villette and uh, Shangri Chow. So we, are, we have five and five. Uh, all the five senior faculty are right Ripley fellows, and three of them are UOT distinguished professors. And uh, this group is actually, the reason why I came to UConnect uh, is because it's a very cohesive, uh, very friendly group that actually collaborates a lot and publishes together. So that's a great thing that uh, the UConn Systems Group is uh, known about. And also is a highly funded uh, group of people in the ECE department. And this excellence in the systems group actually did not start today. So this group had the illustrious background almost since the 1950s. So we had uh, Ralph Kartenberger, who developed uh, describing function theory for nonlinear systems. And that's standard in a lot of the textbooks nowadays. And we had uh, David Lindoff, who actually wrote one of the first books on sample data control systems and also worked on adaptive control. Uh, we had David Kleinman, who was my advisor. I, he was only 33 when I came to UConn, and I didn't know that he was a superstar in optimal control, especially linear quadratic regulator type problems. And also he developed this something called the optimal control model for human response. And of course we have Yakov Bashalom, uh, who did pioneering work in stochastic control, then he went out of control and started with something called multi-target tracking. And I need to tell somebody that a guy from MIT, very well-known professor, John Leonard, who's in mechanical and also ocean engineering, recently told me, he works on self-driving cars. And I told him that, hey, Yakov is getting involved in that. And he said, Yakov is like my god. He's my mentor. And, <coughs> Uh, taught me everything I need to know about tracking. So it's good to be out of control. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, and we also had Charlie Knapp, who did a lot of work in underwater acoustics and also probably the best teacher ever. And uh, David Jordan is a department head extraordinary. He was an excellent department head. Uh, Peter Blue is actually keeping that flame of excellence burning bright into the future with this award by making exceptional contributions to smart cube, smart buildings, smart manufacturing, and smart power systems. And we are very thrilled for you, Peter. Congratulations.
Thank you, uh, Angela, Doc Love, and, and Krishna. So uh, I'd like to invite Peter to say a few words about his work. Okay. Just a few words. <laughs> That's the art of summarizing in a few words a lot of contributions. Thank you very much for, uh, for the dean. What's the dean? Mm -hmm. I have a different hat. Uh, I'm honored and I'm overwhelmed. Really appreciate your coming. I want to first thank my advisor, uh, Larry Hall and Sophia, right, for your coming. I really learned a lot from you. And also all the Asian American movement as we work with Angela and also Suresh. Suresh. Also, we start from Larry. That's through his encouragement, through his enlightening, through various years. Really appreciate that. So I got support from many. Let me just say, say a, few, a few words on some of these issues from university and from family and faith. Y'all know we have great colleagues. Let me just say a few words about Yakov. I got, I moved, I came to know you come because through Yakov. Through lunch at Hunan cafeteria in Cambridge. And he paid me, he paid me for the travel expenses to move from Cambridge to... That was a good investment. <laughs> I think it's about $120. <laughs> it's good you didn't have more furniture. <laughs> and Yakov taught me how to work with industry. The first one is the Northern System. Yakov also brought me to IEEE, Country System Society, working with uh, ACC and, and CDC. Really appreciate that. Also, when we talk about uh, Dave Kleiman, Dave Kleiman brought me to the first research project and with MIT as a subcontract. So you guys are prime. MIT is a subcontract. Krishna, I learned many things from Krishna. Optimization, fault detection, and many things. I really admire his fast thinking and his entrepreneurship with company and with university. It's a very nice balanced work, and his company is making great progress and contribution to the industry. Really appreciate it. And as great students, you know, Manila and so many his students taking the lead on that. Also, I appreciate uh, working with Peng, Peng Zhang. His working experience in the industry really helps quite a bit in terms of uh, working with power systems. My wife said to me, you have 25 hours. <laughs> 25? 25. But Peng, it seems every day he has 48 hours. <laughs> I don't know how hard he works. I think it's really a great department and great group. I also want to thank the leadership from the, uh, yeah, let me say, I want thanks for the nomination team. Nomination? Krishna is a chair of my nomination committee with Yakov, with Rajiv Bansa, with Peter Weller, form as a nomination committee for me. Appreciate that. Also, the leadership from Rajiv Bansa to John Chandy, also from Denary, from Kazan, and from Michael. Really appreciate that. And also the previous, I want I have to mention the previous, our dean and previous provost, Meng Choi, is inspiring, great memory, great vision, and great heart. He's really, we, we really miss him as a provost, but he, he's really good, we, he's really great, and we hope him the best. We have a great uh, students working through the years, so you will see, after my talk, you will see some of those. 
and we'll have someone here really coming from California, coming from New Jersey, and from Hartford. So some other will give some short talk here. Um, I thank my late parents to give me a good education and a loving uh, a risk, uh, environment conducive to learning. Also, I thank my wife for giving me the, the time. <laughs> well, I'm not complaining that you're working to three years, right? That's right. And uh, for a very, very supportive position in various activities. My son, my daughter, and their spouses, and our four grandchildren, is really a, a source of joy, a source of fun. Also, I'm a Christian. We thank some of the Christ my Christian friends here. We thank God for his guidance and protection. Also, thanks uh, brothers and sisters in the church for mutual support, mutual prayer. So let me say something about my work. I'm really excited about it. <clears throat> it's a critical problem. It's a common problem we encounter every day. No one knows how to solve effectively. I think we have a good, great approach. So the it's okay. The key point is optimization. Some of them, some optimization are diff, are easy, some are difficult. The ones that involve discrete scenarios are very difficult. What does it mean? Discrete means you turn on a generator or you turn off a generator. Zero one. You cannot say I turn on the generator 0.7 or 0.8. So discrete either off or on, or you have discrete DC variables. And continuous variables, for example, generation level, once you turn on a generator, what's the generation level? That's a real number. Or the, lead, or the driving speed, or the uh, temperature in the room, those are continuous variables. So there's no good way or private problem, the large problem, no good way to solve a problem either with a discrete DC variable or with both discrete or continuous, that's called mixed problem. So our ideas in the two simple way is decomposition, coordination, decompose and coordinate, and formulation tightening. You might want to say, why optimization? Why don't we optimize? Why optimize? So for students, you want to get what? You want to get, you are satisfied with C or B, you want to get grade A. You want to get a grade A, the question is that, how much time do you have? 48 hours, like for Sajani? <laughs> <laughs> or you have many courses to take? Salaries. Who said after graduation, you want to get 30K per year, I'm satisfied. But how much responsibilities are you willing to take? To like spring break or want to have fun? How much money do you have? And for a company, how much profit do you want to, do you want to make? But how much risk do you want to take? So as a person, as a team, as a department, as a company, want to survive, want a mediocrity, or want excellent? So what's optimization? Optimization is to achieve the best subject to various constraints. That's optimization. So let me just use two examples to illustrate the ideas. One is some power system operation and manufacturing scheduling. First power system operate, uh, operation. So we have a system with a different type of generators, thermal, 
nuclear. And now we have a solar, we have a wind. But all together, they have to meet demand. Demand is time varying, as you can expect. At midnight, demand is very low. But at 9 o'clock, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, it's very high. So the demand is time varying. So the question is that, which generator should we turn on? At what time? And what generator turn on? What's the generation level? Okay. So the turn on, turn off is binary, it's discrete, but generation level is continuous. So it's a mixed one. So how important is the problem? Let me give you an example. For MISO, so that's covering Midwest areas, large independent system operator in, your, uh, in, the, in the States. So per day, per day, the fuel cost is about $50 million. $50 million. If you optimize it, you say 1%, how much is that? 0.1%, how much is that? For each day, how about 365 days? How important is that? So it's probably important. I hope you can sense just from this simple example. So this, as I said, is involves both discrete and confused variables on off are generators and generation levels. So they are important. So smart grid, as we just talked about, intelligent manufacturing for the factory is also crucial and homes and buildings in terms of lighting, in terms of air conditioning, okay, many things. The thing about air conditioning is about consume about more than about 40% of building energy consumption. That's huge. So fundamental difficulties. So we say for a problem with continuous decision levels, um, uh, like this one, So here's continuous DC variables. Suppose here's a cost function. So we know the minimum is this point. And the minimum point has a characteristic that the slope is zero. So we have a necessary condition. So we can develop an algorithm to find out where's x star, the optimum point. So that's well solved. But for discrete DC, DC variables, those points, the function are defined only at a discrete point of time. If you turn left a little bit, turn right a little bit, it's not defined. So there's no gradient, no slope, no necessary conditions, no nothing. So to get to the optimal solution is so difficult. So the complexity increases exponentially. So just like that, when the problem size increases, the complexity increases exponentially. Let me give you an example. It's a small, small quiz. Talk about manufacturing schedule. So which activity to do, on what resources, and what? So think about the simplest case. I have one machine, 10 parts to do. How many possible sequences? You think about if a student have three, three homework assignments, A, B, C. How many possible sequences? The first one do is either A or B or C, is that right? If we do A, the next B or C. We do B, the next A or C. So it's what? Three times two times one. Three factorial. Six possibilities. It's OK. How about one machine, 10 parts? How many possible sequences? 10 factorial. 10 factorial is what? What's the size of 10 factorial? You know, 2 factorial is 2, 3 factorial is 6, and so on. How about 10 factorial? 3.6 million dollars. 3.6 3. million. 
if we want to evaluate each of those to see how good they are, and we have a very fast processor that can evaluate 20 million possibilities per second. Very fast process, 20 million per second. How long do it take? Well, 20 million possibilities per second, but we only have 3.6 3 .6 million possibilities. So what? Less than a second, right? Less than a second. Is that clear? So now if I double the number of parts, 20 parts. How long would it take? Here's less than one second. How, how, how long would this take? How many seconds? Would it, two seconds? One hundred years. What's the guess? One hundred years? Millions of years, millions of years. Millions of years. So say 20 factorial. Divide by 20 million possibilities per second become how many seconds? Okay. So this number is this so many possibilities? That's factorial. Divide by 20 million possibilities. It becomes how many seconds? Divide by 60 becomes how many minutes? Because divide 60 divide how many hours? Divide by 24. <laughs> <laughs> so this comes to where? This comes in China. In China, it's Confucius time. <laughs> in the Bible, it's a Joseph time. <laughs> this is a very simple problem. There's no factory has this kind of setup. For real factory, it's messy, uncertain, huge. So the problem is important, the problem is difficult. Okay. So there's no effective methods. If people use heuristics, the problem is so hard, that's just use heuristics. Okay. So like, for example, for students, which one is due first? You do it first. Right? Which one is the easiest first? I do it first because I get easiest one out, or sometimes I do the, the, the longest one first. The one that takes the longest time, I do it first. But those are heuristics, how good they are. I don't know. You try. So, have you heard about some we shall overcome? We shall overcome. Have you heard of that? <laughs> We're on the way there. How do we do that? So first, we are not trying to get exact output. There's no way to get it. So what, what we want to try to do is to get good solution, but it's not just good. You say watermelon, you say my watermelon is sweet. Nobody would say my watermelon is not sweet. But how sweet it is, how sweet they are. So we want to get good, so good solution, near optimal solution, with quantifiable quality. So we can quantify the quality, how good they are. And we want to do it fast. I think Rob from Massachusetts mentioned to me, for traffic problem or for a industrial problem, you, if you cannot get in 10 minutes <coughs> from the factory, it's got for power systems, 20 minutes or 30 minutes. After that, no way. Nobody going to take a look at your results. We need to do it fast. So we explore several different possible features and separability, duality, linearity, and tightness. You don't have to worry about all this. But essentially, the first is the composition correlation. So the problem is what? The complexity increases exponentially. The problem set increases. So if you say, let's use parallel processing. Parallel processing, the speed up is sublinear. You cannot help. But you're going to decompose it, the problem set becomes smaller. The complexity decreases exponentially. So that's a feature. So an example about how do we divide 200 people, 200 apples among 50 <coughs> people? How do we divide? 200 apples, 200 apples divide into among 50 people. How do we do that? How do we do that? 
Each one get what? Four. Okay. Is that good? Very good. Well, <laughs> we have been here. Oh, Professor Hai here. So should we get four as well? So I can say, okay. But Dean should get zero. <laughs> <laughs> So we say, as we did some, then we got double or let Professor Hood get double? Is that good? I'm allergic to apple. I don't want any. <laughs> Someone's crazy about apple, they want more. So what's a good way? So you know market currently. What's market? You set a price, then you adjust the price based on supply and demand. If I say one apple is one cent, tell me how many do you want? Okay. So I'm not doing myself, I'm not doing optimization myself, but I let you do the optimization. So rather than for me to solve a big problem, but you individually solve much smaller problem because I give you the price. You tell me how many you want. That's easy for us. So you can tell me, so one cent is too, too, too cheap, now we get a request for 500. I have 200. What do I do? Raise the price. I say $5 per piece. So again, I adjust the price, and you tell me, you do the calculation. I don't do the calculation. You do the calculation. You tell me. So $5. Expensive, so may I, may I may even get 10. I got a lot to be left, to be rotten, so what do I do? I reduce price, and I keep on doing this, till roughly, I say, the demand's about 205. I say, okay, stop. Okay, then you simply use it to get a the solution. So it's a divide and conquer. Also, before I do the heuristics, the cost there is a lower bound of the optimal cost. So I get lower bound, I get physical cost, I can quantify the quality of the solution. So essentially, this decomposition coordination, this Lagrange relaxation, the price is shadow price. Okay. So decompose a problem, you solve the individual solve problem, which are much easier than for one to solve it. I just price based upon supply demand principle, use heuristic, heuristic to get a feasible solution and measure the quality based on more value. This is in calculus, this is in economics 101. So is that, so it's okay, but if I say, if I have Apple, not just for today, but also for tomorrow and the day after tomorrow, for seven days, not just for apples, but also have uh, mangoes, watermelons, and so on. So I have a price for each day, for each fruit. So then I generally set the prices, let you solve it, tell me, and adjust. So this, again, this is economics 101. It's too simple. This is so intuitive and has been the market has been run on that for hundreds of years. What's the difficulty? The difficulty is because of discrete decision variables. Because of this discrete decision variables, because we assume apples, we can just either one or two or three, we cannot say, can we, can we share apples with you? Okay. So it's discrete, the problem becomes very, very difficult. So we have this kind of exponential growth complexity. But we believe the focus and decomposition is the only way to solve this thing called the complexity increase. Exponential increase of complexity because for decomposing, the problem becomes so simple, the complexity decreases exponentially. By the way, I have 13 slides altogether. We're on, on page nine. Now we're on page, page 10. So major difficulty is because of the existence of discrete decision variables. So we do not have the slope, we don't have the gradient, but we have subgradient. 
So that, I don't, you don't have to understand all this, but the difficulty is that it doesn't work. The method, once in all discrete is enough, doesn't work. So in the 90s, people are still using this for power systems. But in the early 2000s, one by one, people give up. Move to French cut. If you see, move to CPLEC or Groove. So when we present the work, they say, are you still working on this? Why are you still working on this? Nobody's working on this. So it seems to be a death to the like relaxation or decomposition coordination approach. But under the support from Joseph and working with uh, Michal, we really found a breakthrough. We overcame all the major difficulties of this traditional organization. Overcome the difficulties one at a time. So it was a different insight, different approach, and different results. So the method becomes so powerful, really making use of uh, the exponential reduction complexity of quantity conversation. We have a very good way to coordinate. We have a very powerful method called surrogate, algorithm relaxation, and also we have, you don't have to worry about this, uh, absolute value, surrogate absolute value to actually convert this. You don't worry about all this. So it's a decomposition coordination approach that's <laughs> erected and raise performance to a new level of success. So that's the decomposition coordination. The second is formal machine tagging. Think about this, we have a linear problem. Now we're talking about the linear problem. Suppose here, these are the constraints. These are the constraints, linear constraints. We have to find the points inside, inside this. And suppose level curves are like this. In a sense, all the points along this line has a cost of 100. All here has a cost of 80. All here has 60. This one is, this one is better for this a lower left curve. So it's a linear, we call this because objective function is linear, controls are linear, so it's a linear for the problem. <coughs> so can you tell me what's the solution? But to find the best point, the one with the smallest value inside is higher. So it should be this point, right? It should be this point. So this is the solution. The problem, this linear problem problem is easy. It's well solved. The packages, you can use it. Okay, let me ask you a question. Suppose we are restrict ourselves to discrete DC variables. There are nine points, nine feasible points. We are not talking about confused variables, but we have discrete decisions. There are nine points. Tell me which one is the best point. Again, this object function, you can see the points here with a cost about 100. Right? This one is uh, in between this about the 90, is about 70 plus, and this is the best. Is that clear? That's a bad point. This is a bad point. But that best point is not the same as the confused best point. Not different. So this confused point, the green part is easy to obtain. The red one is hard. It's hard. The question is that can we convert the problem? Can we break, construct the constraint? The previous constraint are like this. If we reconstruct constraint so that constraint directly describe this convex hole. Think about this. Side Square. Suppose we can convert the constraint to directly mean this kind of thing. 
then we use the linear folding problem to solve it. Which point are we to, which point are we going to get? Are we going to get this point? Yes. So if we, in the pre-processing state, can reconstruct the constraint, like we call tightening, okay? the, the constraint are tight, but once you get this, the constraints are tight. Okay, get tight constraints, therefore when we really solve the problem, it's a linear problem. There's no, no complexity. Problem. So once we obtain the convex hull, we get the optimum solution. So essentially, the combinatorial problem comes simple. So the question, how do you do it? How do we do it? Very few people look into this issue. How do people like, how do we solve it? Given the problem, how do we solve it? Nobody said, how can we really form this problem? So that we can solve it easily. So we spin support from ISO New England, who did some, some breakthrough. In the literature, nobody, a few people present a tight formulation, but nobody said, how do you do it? So let me use a simple example to illustrate the idea. So we have binary problem, problem that's a binary, so zero, one. We have two variables, x1, x2. X1 could be 0, 1. X2 could be 0, 1. The constraints X1 plus X2 should be greater than or equal to 25. So you, you think about this. We have a square. We have a square. So this is X1. This is X2. The X1 could be 0 or 1. X2 could be 0 or 1. So this point is a 0, 0. X1 equals 0. X2 equals 0. This one, x1 equals 1, x2 equals 0. This x1 equals 0, x2 equals 1, and so on. So we are in this box, cubic, this square. Constraints that we have to be on this side. Is that clear? Is problem clear? So what are the feasible points? So there are four points. This point. This point, this point, this point. But this point is not feasible because x1 is 0, x2 equals 0. That does not satisfy the constraint. So only three points satisfy the constraint. Three. So these are the three points satisfy the constraint. So treat this constraint is like this. So we have, we have this area, but we really want to have this one. The question of giving original constraint, how can we convert constraint so that we get this triangle? How do we do that? So you think about it, if we relax the constraint that's x1, x2 to be binary, so x1 could be from 0 to 1 anything, x2 could be 0 to 1 to anything, and we have this entire square there. So if we relax integrality constraint, and we can get this convex hull, but this integer relaxed form, we can get this, this five points, five dots. We get five dots, easily. Okay, they get this five dots easily. But we don't want these five dots. We only want three dots. So with this giving five dots, we want to go back to get the three dots. Three dots. They describe the convex hull. Once we get convex hull, the problem is up. It's a linear problem. So easy. So how do we get that? So we can see this actual, this actual. We want to take, we want to get rid of those. How do we get rid of those? All these variables, coordinate, are either binary or binary. Is it zero? But this one, and this x2 is 4.5, it's not bad. This one, x1 is 4.5, it's not bad. So if we drop any of the coordinates, any of the points, whose coordinate, who, whose coordinate are not bad, just drop them. Nothing else. Just drop them. Once we drop them, 
Once we drop it, then we get contact from. That's it. So nobody look at this. So being we look at this, it's so simple. We just drop those non non integer, non binary uh, vertices. We drop them, then we get convex hull. So they can be done in the data pre-processing stage. We don't have to do it in the real optimization process, but in the data pre-processing stage, we can do it. And then optimization will be simple. But still, to get this still complexity, so what we want to do is Well, for the entire problem, it's hard to do, but when we become close to the subproblem, we can tighten the subproblem formulation. So we have shown that this approach is really powerful. You know, we become close or not, it's powerful, but it essentially goes hand in hand with the decomposition coordination approach. We first decompose problem into smaller problems, subproblem, and we tighten the formulation, we we'll coordinate. The last slide. The takeaway, this kind of problem with discrete decision levels is inherently difficult. But we see it every day, everywhere. No one has a good solution. There's heuristics, there's particle swarm, we're using many other things, no good solution. So our goal is not to get up the solution, but rather want to get the up the solution with quantifiable quality and the fast. And the approach is the composition coordination. That's general. But with for linear problem, we can do a systematic way to tighten the formulation for some problems. And we can do it in the very effective way. In a sense, we believe it's fundamentally resolve such difficult problems. So we have another version that's Mihaus and Bing's developing. With a distributed asynchronous version, we think about industry 4.0 for future factories. We can have self optimizing factory. People talk about industry 4.0 for the industry, for manufacturing, say self configuration, self diagnosis, self this and self that, self optimization. What's the theory? There's no theory. This will provide theory. Not just the build, uh, factories, but also grids and buildings. While working with uh, Professor Zhang, I'm just trying to develop this uh, self-optimizing uh, smart grid and micro grid. Thank many former students, current students, and colleagues. And for today's talk, especially thanks for Mihail, Bing, and Joseph for providing the support. I think we shall welcome. We're on the way. Thank you very much. I'm Bing Yan, currently an assistant research professor working with the Professor Lu. I obtained my PhD with him uh, from 2016. Now I feel very honored to stand here to introduce our remaining speakers, all uh, former students of Professor Lu. Let me introduce the first one, Professor Shi Zhong Zhang. He graduated in uh, 2000, uh, sorry, he graduated in 1986. He is the first student of Pro Professor Lu. Currently, he is a professor at National Taiwan University in the Department of Electrical Engineering and also Institute of Industrial Engineering. He was also director of uh, uh, Institute of Industrial Engineering at NTU and also a commissioner of National Com uh, Communications Commission in Taiwan. In 2011, he became a member of the Yukon Academy of Distinguished Engineers. Now let us take a look what does he want to say to Professor Lu uh, across the ocean. Professor Liu, Mrs. Liu, distinguished guests, friends, and professors of UConn, congratulations to Professor Liu and Mrs. Liu. 
I was very lucky to be the first doctoral student of Professor Liu. I would like to thank Professor Liu for five precious things I learned. First, write it down and well. In my graduate study under Professor Liu, writing weekly technical notes and revision after revision of a manuscript or a proposal was really painful. <laughs> However, in this era of knowledge economy, it is a profession of a publish or perish. Now it is me telling my students to write it down and well. Second, let us play game. I had thought I got a research assistantship to play games when I got the offer letter from Professor Liu in March 1981. Inspired by Professor Liu, I have since enjoyed the fascinating research area of game theory and incentive control. When I served as a commissioner in the National Communications Commission Taiwan a few years ago, I was highly benefited on doing regulatory policy design. I love to play games together with you, Professor Liu. <laughs> Optimize with an open mind and persistent effort. Professor Liu's talk today shares his research on Lagrange relaxation-based optimization. I remember I went in the summer of 1982 with Professor Liu to discuss with a biotech company in Connecticut about optimizing the supply of nearly hatched eggs to chicken farms worldwide. I was so impressed to see Professor Liu's attitude toward problem solving Openness in setting the goal, smart relaxation of complicating constraints, and persistent pursuits. Fourth, serve the community. Let me share one service activity of Professor Liu that you might not know. Since 2007, Professor Liu has been leading a weekly Bible study in the cyberspace, consisting of group members in various countries. I have received more than 500 copies of Bible study materials over the years. <laughs> Fifth and the last and the most important of all, let me quote Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. Professor Liu and Mrs. Liu helped me accept Jesus Christ as my Savior in my last year at UConn, which has been the treasure of my life. Professor Liu and Mrs. Liu, thank you so much. Congratulations to you again. Thanks, yes, Professor John, for sharing his stories with us. I think the best thing of being professors is to see that your students are teaching their students the way that they are taught. <laughs> <laughs> so the second speaker is a Professor Xiao Hongguan. He graduated in 1993. Uh, Currently, he is a professor in uh, Xi'an Jiufeng University in China. He is also Changjiang Professor of uh, System Engineering and also the Dean of the uh, School of Electronic and Information Engineering. He was also the head of the Department of Automation and also the director of the Center for Intelligent and Network Systems at Tsinghua University. Also, he is a member of a Chinese uh, Academy of Science, a HB fellow, and also a member of the Yukon Academy of Distinguished Engineers. So let, uh, let us see what is his story. <laughs> professor Lu, distinguished professor and teacher of Yukon, the fellow students of Professor Lu's group. I'm Xiao Hongguan from Xi'an Jiaohong University and Tsinghua University. I used to be Professor Lu's student and his team member. <clears throat> I studied at UConn with Professor Lu from a PhD degree from 1988 to 1993. I still remember very vividly my first presentation made to Professor Lu, my first TA class, the discussion and argument and our group meeting, and so many dinner we had at Professor Lu's house, especially his first house at Manfield Center. I can't appreciate too much on my education at UConn with Professor Lu and the opportunity Professor Lu gave to me. 
Without this education, I cannot have my current career, and I cannot have what I'm having now. I sincerely wish Professor Lu will have a greater achievement, and all the students at Professor Lu's group will complete their education at UConn smoothly and have a great and bright career in the near future. Thank you very much. Well, as the grandfather of this. You must have like a hundred grandchildren. Something like that. You yeah. can look on mathematical genealogy. I have to complete it. <laughs> but let me make one comment and follow with two short questions. The comment, as a student giving talks, I know how much time you put into this short talk. And I'm really impressed. There's no criticism I can make. I would I would love to have made such a talk. Now it reminds me of the Dr. Samuel Johnson, the Scottish literate, he once wrote a short letter and uh, he said, I apologize for writing such a short letter because I don't have time to write a longer one. And giving short talks is really uh, something diff difficult. Most of you may not pay attention, but as a student, I paid a lot of attention to giving talks, and this is one of the best talks I've And I'm going to recommend it to everybody. To Short comment, a short question. One, first, this is technical. You very clearly illustrate that your breakthrough depends on the formulation type. You give a very good example, two dimensional, very clear, excellent. But one of the dirty secrets of mathematics is that as the dimension goes up, number variable goes up, it gets much more complicated. So my question to you is, is your method make it still easy to drop the variables and so forth? So we don't just good question. We so we don't just like optimization. We don't actually demand for true optimal. True. Like, like tightness, we yeah, just I looking for that, that part. near tightness. But he's already going to decompose the problem with the smaller dimension. So so okay. yeah. For so example, you think it's even high demand is easier to, to learn which thing to drop? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so near tightness. Uh, near tightness. Uh, Second short question, of course, this, some people, everybody will ask, have you solved, I uh, try to compare with older methods and solve a problem that couldn't be solved before? Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> and thank you, Professor uh, He, for the speech. I think to all of us, all the memories with Professor Lu are always invaluable treasures to us. When we look back, it is more than wonderful. So our next speaker is Dr. Uh, Joseph Yan, who graduated uh, in 1994. Currently, he is the principal manager for fundamental modeling and analysis at uh, Southern California Edison. He is also a member of the UConn Academy of Distinguished Engineers. There's no picture for him, because he is right, uh, he's just sitting right there. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, again, I'm you know, Joseph Yan, and uh, I'm you know, Professor Lu's student between you know, 1998 and 1994. Um, Professor Lu uh, was tough and uh, was very demanding. And, uh, I don't know how many students are still here, and I believe he's still you know, tough and he's still you know, demanding. And uh, I have learned a lot from you know, Professor Lu. What I learned helped me to complete my education and also advance my career in real world as well. Professor Lu is a teacher and Professor Lu is a mentor. And I still remember and when I first time read the, you know, write the paper and uh, get the, you know, Professor Lu's comments, and, uh, such as not clear, bad sentence, and why here? <laughs> <laughs> And, and uh, Professor Lu spent a lot of his time to help me to revise the paper. And uh, 
and you know, uh, you know, with the many, many iterations, you guys see iterations, iterations, many, many iterations, and a day and a night. We have 24 hours a day, or to, you know, 48 hours a day. <laughs> Going through this in you know, a process, and I have learned how to write the technical papers, and also improve my English. And more importantly, and I I develop a work work ethics and know how to pursue the excellence. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Lu, for all you have done, you know, for all uh, so many of us. And uh, congratulations! And uh, you are a board and of a trustee, distinguished professor, and uh, you are in a well deserved. You know. Congratulations. Dr. Yan, he is a sponsor of our lab. I think supporting Professor Lu and our big family is a thing that we always want to do and we will do. So our next speaker is uh, Dr. Robert Tomaschik, who graduated in 1995. Currently, he is technical fellow for operations research at Pratt & Whitney. He was also a manager for operation optimization uh, at UTRC. Welcome back home. Peter, 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 congratulations. Um, so there were a few reasons why I decided to, to study under Peter, and those reasons still ring true today, amazingly. Um, if, if there are basically three reasons. The, the first was it was clear then, as it is now, Peter was a very accomplished researcher and teacher. And obviously, when you want to study under someone, that's very important. Uh, also, Peter um, was then, as now, very much tied into industry, and his philosophy of solving problems that are practical have an industrial impact was very important to me, and I saw that in Peter, and that rings true over these many years. Um, and lastly, and just as importantly, I could tell uh, when I first met Peter that he was a very caring, kind, and uh, humble person, and that was, that was very true then, and it's been ever, true ever since. So those are some of the reasons um, that, that I decided to join Peter, and uh, I just want to thank you for that. Um, Peter, congratulations on, on Board of Trustees. Uh, it's an amazing honor. We're very well deserved. The amount of knowledge that you've created and disseminated through your publications, patents, and of course through your teaching students like myself and others here today um, is just incredible. And you've had an impact. I, I can, I've seen it myself. I've helped make that impact at United Technologies, where we have, of course, sell products that serve that help buildings be more efficient, <coughs> manufacturing production planning, all those areas are, are very important to United Technologies and your work has contributed, contributed to that. Um, lastly, on a personal note, again, I would just like to thank you for teaching and mentoring me. Um, it's meant, meant a lot to me. Um, and between you and this great school of engineering at UConn has provided me with a really solid foundation of skills and knowledge that have served me very well over the years. So congratulations, Peter. And thank you. Dr. Tomastic, I think no matter where we came from, no matter what we are now, and no matter what we are doing, we are always Professor Lu's students. So student a day, Huskies forever, uh, Huskies forever right? So our next speaker is uh, Professor Michael Bragan. I think uh, for the one who already took Professor's class, you know him well, right? He's famous for uh, ICR, right? Let's welcome to him. Dear colleagues, friends, and guests, let me start my speech by asking you what makes a scientist great. If you ask me to use one word, I would say what makes a scientist great is his vision. To me, the true vision is not the ability to see what others can see. It is the ability to see what nobody else could see for years, or decades, sometimes even uh, centuries. Peter Lu's vision is truly great. To put things in uh, perspective, let's think about this. It took roughly 220 years before Albert Einstein was able to re re revolutionize physics after Isaac Newton published his work on laws of motion. In a similar way, during 
roughly 220 years since Joseph Lagrange published his, his uh, seminal paper, nobody was able to uh, revolutionize the La La Lagrangian relaxation method until Peter Liu realized that notwithstanding the difficulties of the method that, that he just mentioned, there are smart ways to uh, overcome those uh, difficulties so that the res re resulting method, as far as I know, to answer uh, Larry Ho's uh, question, beats other methods, hands down. I, I would like to con 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 congratulate Peter Liu on this great achievement. No great achievement like that would be possible without this great vision. No problems of importance would be possible to solve without this great vision. Vision is the great trait of a great scientist. That's what sets a great uh, 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 scientist apart, what makes a difference in the world. And now, allow me to introduce the final speaker, the, the pro professor who was also part of this vision, Binyan. Yeah, at last, I also want to uh, say a few words. As we just saw, all of uh, Professor Lu's former students are all doing very well, no matter in academic or in uh, uh, industry. I was very lucky to stand on their shoulders. So as the only female student speaker today, I want to tell some small stories about Professor Lu. So first one, he is a patient. He has corrected my pronunciations for thousands of times since I came to Yukon, <laughs> yeah. such as idea method and cut, you know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> also, he taught me how to write papers, proposals, technical report, uh, reports, etc., word by word, literally, word by word. Second, he is dedicated. So once I asked him a question, how would he uh, process all his emails? Because he may receive uh, hundreds of them every day. Is there an efficient method? He said, no. I will just read them uh, one by one. So that's why <laughs> You may receive his email at 4 p.m. or even 5, uh, sorry, 4 a.m. or even 5 a.m. I receive at 1 a.m. Always <laughs> <laughs> up. Yeah. Last but not least, he is enthusiastic. Although he has taught his classes for so many years, but he would still spend a whole day, at least a whole day, to prepare for uh, his class every week. So once I received a phone call from um, Mrs. Lu, so saying uh, he was, uh, sorry, she was locked outside the house. <coughs> he called Professor Lu's office, but no one answered. So guess what? Professor Lu is preparing, uh, was preparing for his class and didn't pick up the phone. So he answers emails, but not phone calls. <laughs> <laughs> I don't answer that yeah. <laughs> I think Professor Lu sets an excellent example for us how to be a, a great factory member, a researcher, a teacher, and also a mentor. He always say, good, good, good to throw away. You have to be excellent. I sincerely thank him for his uh, years of uh, mentorship. So now, let us give him a, 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 sorry, a big round of applause for his achievements in research, in teaching, and in service. <laughs> There's some food. Please enjoy. Thank you. Thank you all for coming.
Did you want me to take one with that? No, there's uh, not, there are too many people. Uh, 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 I just took a whole bunch, so okay. one of them has to be gone. Right? Small group, small group. Hey, yo, She's not here today, so I cannot answer. If they want to be in the Technique to kind of turn Uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's
it's programmed using uh, the language, and the solver will kind of use something called Express. It, it's part of the commercial we have transmission system. We have a 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 system. We of the we have a muni so that's the size. Yeah. So, so you, you break the time into hours or days? Um, that must be hours. Right? Yeah, it's, you know, it has hourly. Hourly speed. Hourly speed. Yeah. So hourly for a week. Yeah, it's a one hundred. Yeah. Times three thousand generators. And uh, okay. and also then miles. Mm -hmm. okay. Different types of generators. You have a few here. You have a few. You don't have. Oh no, 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 no. Uh, we in the future, we are in the, the nuclear in the, in the future is you know uh, is a by the law. Okay. Really? Yeah. Um, the, the uncertainty is uh, uh, to deal with uncertainty is you, you as a master, we do have a reserve and the modules. So when our load is 100 and our capability usually is 107, we have 7 and a megawatts to deal with it. And, and the, the line lost, you know, you lost the line, you lost the unit, and the solar is not generated. And the uncertainty is increased. You want to require the, the increase the you know, margins of capacity you can do that. Mm -hmm. But you know, uh, that is not the only problem. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's the complexities. How do you integrate it together? Because right now, and you don't have that you know, issue. The fuel, gas, we always assume there. Uh, hydro, we think it's a limited resource, but the water is there. And your water is still in your reservoir. You can push the button, it's going to be generated. Mm -hmm. And then, um, yeah, gas is going to be there, but the wind and the solar, yeah. the fuel is the, the function of the time. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, you know, and, and also Mother Nature too. Yeah. Mother Nature, I already deal with. We, we yeah. increase the margin to deal, but the fuel is uh, is you know is a you know function of the time that in, you know increase and in the complex dramatic. Yeah. So all the techniques you use to manage the system, are they all, the software and algorithms are all essentially developed internally to, no. to your company or do you buy? You know, Joseph, we are not, you know, like developing it. And okay. uh, it's, it has to be commercial. Okay, so how do you incorporate Peter's results into commercial software? No, no that, uh, you know, that's the only time, because I try to uh, push it in a later, in, in, the, in a 2000, 15 or 2014, because our company is going to be significant downsides. I don't have that money. Yeah. They cut all my you know, um, the budget. 
in the people's ear. But other than, you know, either you keep the, the, the head or you uh, cut, you know, that's, you know, so that's why I stopped. Originally, what I thought of the methodology and what you push it, the federal government to uh, adopt this approach. And then I can use our company, and we're not actually going to continue the company go through there. And the fourth, the, and we're going to fight, and the uh, section, you know, to win. Uh, to win is I'm just unreasonable rate occurred in our market. And the fourth then changed everything. And which is also changed the objective function too. And I mentioned to you before. And currently, product, you know, all the market in, you know, formed the prices is based on the, and you can it's based on the, 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 the world, you know, when the utilities are integrated, the vertical integrated utility company, the people all put the cost. Right now, the, the market is not the cost, it's the bit. And the bits sometimes reflect the cost, sometimes just completely different. Once you beyond the marginal cost mm -hmm. and, uh, and the social welfare maximization oh. unit commitment, but you have the bit, you're trying to minimize mm -hmm. the underneath the triangle cost. Mm -hmm. And you set the price, everybody pays that price. Basically, it's rectangle. Mm -hmm. In the previous series, if this is all cost, mm -hmm. I minimize the total. And, and the production cost, mm -hmm. and then I, it will equivalent to maximize the social welfare. Because it actually demands the vertical, mm -hmm. and this is a, you know, this is a company. Mm -hmm. Once you deviate from that, and you're not, you know, you cannot accomplish maximize the social welfare, mm -hmm. and then and the, the price you're setting, mm -hmm. and the residuals is not the social welfare. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we said, the, you know, I you know, identified this problem, and then we said the price needed to be the, in the function. We minimize not triangle anymore. It's the, the in the rectangle, mm -hmm. and then this is unsolvable because you see, it's a, it, it, the, the structure is not separate because the price is related to the all the generations mm -hmm. in for that hour, mm -hmm. and also and it's also is in the in the product. Product, you know, product of the price versus your generation. Mm -hmm. There's a cross you know, the, the terms there. Mm -hmm. So then we started this about 10 years. Mm -hmm. And the company lost, yeah, company lost um, and cut the, the, all the cost. Uh, you know, we, are, we, are, we become the, you know, the boom, mm -hmm. the, the skeleton thing. Nice. There's no <laughs> need. Yeah. And my boss is the SVP of the company is uh, Mr. Cotton. And he's the you know in an OPEX. I see. So yeah, you know. Okay. Alright. Should we go out? Sure, sure, yeah. sure, sure. Can we speak for you? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. You. No, I I actually have the point uh I'm gonna die with my story. So we oh, okay. yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Y